Who are we? Am I the same person to myself than I am to my friends? To my family? Is identity singular, or is it more of a loose configuration of attitude and facts about ourselves? Some that we share and some that we don't. Or is it even more abstract than that? Persona is the story of a nurse named Alma and an actress named Elizabeth. The latter is taken ill under mysterious circumstances. Alma frequently compares herself to Elizabeth. Alma confesses to cheating on her fiancé in an orgy with underage boys. She became pregnant and had an abortion. It's revealed later that Elizabeth became pregnant as well, wanted the child to die, but he was born. She hated him, and he was starved for attention. To understand Persona, or at least give it context, we first need to understand modern art, or modernism. The term sounds so broad, but it also has commonalities, traits, and goals specific to its subsection. Before the 19th century, the biggest and most well-known artists, with the most famous and most lasting works, were employed by wealthy benefactors. This means royalty or the church. That's why when you look at classical art, the most frequent subjects you'll see are famous lords and religious or mythological depictions. Art was gorgeous, but it was also often impersonal. Modernism can actually be seen as being influenced by the Industrial Revolution. Transportation, like the railroad and the steam engine, changed the way people lived and worked and traveled, and that expanded their worldview. Big cities flourished and people went there for work. To put it in terms we can more easily understand, in the same way that the internet made our world smaller and gave us access to new information, the Industrial Revolution did the same thing for the 18th and 19th centuries. Artists began making their art about new places and new ideas. The invention of photography and later cinematography changed both the subjects of art and the tools in which we express art. Modernism tears apart traditional forms to give us the idea that modern life is the removal of the past and its rigid notions of how things are supposed to be. Modernism, as an art movement, has several key qualities, and Persona pretty much has all of them. One is destruction. The idea that the chaos of modern times is not necessarily a negative, but simply a removal of classical traditions. Persona is destructive, both in terms of how it tears down traditional narrative, but even how it picks apart film itself. It also breaks convention by portraying women as sexual beings with their own autonomy and agency. The next element of modernism is fragmentation. Plot, characters, images, and themes are broken down into individual parts. Everything is disjointed. Persona portrays women who are pieces of a whole. Another element is exile from old truths and ambiguous meaning to our lives. And Persona certainly exhibits those traits as well, as we will explain later. Essayist Lloyd Michaels once said, Persona certainly stands today as one of the supreme examples of modernist art the cinema has yet produced. Like the central works of modernism in other forms, Picasso's Cubist paintings, Parandello's plays, Eliot's The Wasteland, Joyce's Ulysses, it exhibits the qualities of fragmentation, self-reflexivity, and ambiguity associated with the movement that came into prominence at the beginning of the century while retaining a spirit of experimentation that makes it still seem a film in search of its own laws. Okay, so it breaks down conventions and challenges traditional ideas about all sorts of things, but what is it even about? Well, let's go through this step by step. The opening of a film usually establishes something. It can establish mood and pacing, setting and tone. It can establish a main character and his basic traits, or it can provide exposition so we can skip right to the action afterwards. The opening to Persona is none of these things, or all of these things. It's imagery, it's foreshadowing, it's laying out all the cards of the film on the table. It's a visual poem that both sets up the film and explains it all in a kind of code in the hidden language of images. We'll return to the opening scene, this twisted montage, a few times. We'll have to, because everything is there. When you watch it the first time, it feels like it's establishing tone and serves as the prologue, and it does, but after seeing the movie, if you watch the opening again, it feels more like a condensed version of the entire film. The clues become the bigger picture. The parts become the whole. In the main part of the film, after the prologue, Persona concerns itself with identity. The identity of ourself that we have in our minds and the identity of what we are to other people. The idea that others are deciding who we are more than ourselves. That others are choosing our roles for us, whether it's gender roles, 
family roles like that of being a mother, or anything else that seems to be not of our choosing. Life that forces itself on us without our consent. Life that we can't stop. A loss of our own identity because we never have full freedom of action due to our interactions with others. It's more complicated than that, but there's one scene in the film that encapsulates these themes. Tror du inte jag förstår den hopplösa drömmen om att vara, inte verka utan vara. I varje ögonblick medveten, baksam och samtidigt avgrunden mellan vad du är inför andra och vad du är inför dig själv. Svindelkänslan och den ständiga hungern att äntligen få bli avslöjad. This is repeated when Alma discovers a letter written by Elizabeth. In it, Elizabeth says that Alma is struggling with her own perception of herself and how it doesn't conform to her actions. Almost as if she's two people or that her personality is not so easy to pin down. Maybe nobody can be so easily explained. And that, more than anything, is the heart of the film. We can't really stop there though, because there's another layer to all of this. Remember, modernist art is often personal, and that's certainly the case here. Some of Bergman's earlier films were more concerned with man's relationship with God, if any. More metaphysical than physical. Broad strokes. But if Persona is about how one views oneself and how one is viewed by others, this also relates to Bergman as an artist. Some of Persona came from Bergman's fears about his own creativity and how he was perceived. Not so much a case of vanity as it was insecurity. Persona was born, at least in part, from the director's understanding of the challenging relationship between the artist and the audience. Bergman once wrote, I have always had the ability to attach my demons to my chariot, and they have been forced to make themselves useful. At the same time, they have still managed to keep on tormenting and embarrassing my private life. The owner of the flea circus, as you might be aware, has a habit of letting his artists suck his blood. In a sense, Persona is a film about film. Bergman even suggested the title of the film could be cinematography, before being warned against it. What can we gather from all this? Well, it may mean that Persona is showing us film at the beginning and the end with two purposes. First, it lets us know that this quest to find identity isn't only that of the women and their roles in society. It's also a quest of the artist. It's a conflict. Second, it explains the plot better than anything. As we watch everything unfold, we wonder what is real and what is fantasy. What is in the mind of Alma? What is in the mind of Elizabeth? Is all of this literal? Or are we watching their interaction through a more subjective lens? When we see the physical film at the end, we accept that everything we just watched may be a lie. Maybe their lives are a movie too, a fiction, a fantasy. Maybe everything we tell ourselves about who we are is a lie. Halfway through the film, this happens. All hell breaks loose. The film is cut, burned, and we are left wondering what we are really seeing. Is this all a lie? Are we all a lie? Maybe that's why Elizabeth refuses to speak. She's refusing to take part in the lie. It's said that it's a form of protest. This isolates her, but she has realized that lie that we tell ourselves about who we are, and she can't stand to take part in it anymore. So what about the beginning montage of clips? Well, here we see animation. Someone reflecting in water. A cartoon. A child. Innocence. And then later in the film, we see a real person doing the same. Only at this point, we know the film's contention that, as said earlier, our notions of life do not accord with our actions. We see a lamb being slaughtered and then the Lamb of God. Bergman called this dull stuff, because maybe this was his old work. Preoccupation with heaven, now burned up in the projector. Then a wall becomes a forest. A dead end becomes endless possibilities. Elizabeth's silence is not a dead end, but something that frees herself. Then a mysterious child touches the face of a woman, but she's been blurred out to the point that we don't know her identity. The ghost child could belong to either woman. The image of the face shifts between the two, he is the representation of the unwanted. His presence gives us clues about both Alma and Elizabeth. For a film that was almost called cinematography, 
we simply must discuss the look of this film. Not only its beauty, but how its visuals complement the film thematically. Cinematographer Sven Nykvist once said in an interview, Sufficient time is rarely taken to study light. It is as important as the lines the actors speak, or the direction given to them. It is an integral part of the story, and that is why such close coordination is needed between the director and cinematographer. Light is a treasure chest. Once properly understood, it can bring another dimension to the medium. This is one of my favorite shots in the film. It's so simple, but it's perfect. Elizabeth's face is slowly growing darker. The lighting is dimmed more and more as this scene continues. We get this sense that we can't reach her, that she's not just fading from the screen, but from the world. But her eyes are wide open. Maybe that means her disappearance is deliberate, part of her protest. And here, in arguably the most famous scene in the film, we see soft lighting. The light source is so faint that Elizabeth materializes almost like a phantom, like a dream. Because of the lighting, we are left wondering if this is really happening. Later, the two discuss the night before, bathed in natural light, the light of day. Everything is clearer. Alma, now with the fog of the evening, and the soft lighting gone, asks Elizabeth if last night even happened. Elizabeth denies it. The film employs a lot of close-ups. In this scene, there is only a face. Even the background is gone. It doesn't even exist. It's reminiscent of the famous silent film, The Passion of Joan of Arc. We focus exclusively on the character. Their reaction is everything. The rest of the world has melted away. And that's the film. Introspection of the mind of the soul, reflection of self.